On the south bank of the Thames, opposite Westminster, stands the County Hall, the home of the London County Council. The London County Council consists of 129 councillors and 21 aldermen. It meets every other Tuesday afternoon to decide how to tackle a variety of subjects important to everyone who lives or works in the County of London. They discuss ambulances, clinics, drainage, bridges, roads, buildings, parks, schools, fire engines, cinemas. All these things come under the authority of the London County Council. The London County Council is responsible for an area of 117 square miles and a population of three and a half million people. Many people today consider themselves to be Londoners who live not only a long way from Bow Bells, but even outside the area of the administrative county. This map shows how the built-up area of London spreads far beyond the administrative county, which is shown by a white line. To understand how the London County Council works and why the boundary is an artificial line, it is necessary to know how London has grown up. In the old Roman city of Londinium, where the Thames narrowed to a width that could be bridged, London Bridge was built and London was born. Through the surrounding forests stretched the Roman roads. There were isolated settlements at what is now Wanstead, Leighton, Clapton, Greenwich and so on. Here the first Londoner made his abode. If we look at London in the time of Oliver Cromwell, we find that the forests have disappeared and villages at Chelsea, Clapham, Deptford, Stepney and Islington have come into existence. But even though 1500 years have passed, London has not grown alarmingly. True, the city of London, dominated by the old St Paul's, has now joined itself to the city of Westminster, but they are still separated from the villages by fields and country lanes. The Puritan Londoner of Cromwell's day still lived within the narrow limits that were bounded east and west by Bow and Westminster. A hundred years later, though London had grown to be probably the largest city in the world, its population was still only three quarters of a million. Wren's St Paul's, newly rebuilt after the Great Fire, now dominated the city. And a new style of building around squares, copied from the Italians, had come into vogue. In this age, London architects probably produced their finest work. But the life of the Londoner was now to be rapidly changed by the advent of the Industrial Revolution. By the year 1850, London doubled its size and trebled its population. The country had receded out of the lives of the majority of Londoners. New houses and indeed whole suburbs had sprung up at an alarming rate. Long rows of big houses for the rich, while the poor were either housed in hastily built houses that soon became squalid or else crowded into old 18th century buildings. The Londoner faced new problems of living, but who had the authority to solve them? The Lord Mayor, then as now the Chief Magistrate of the City of London with the ancient city corporation, had governed the city since Norman times, but the metropolis of London, far, far greater in extent than the city, now spread over part of the counties of Middlesex, Kent and Surrey and was ruled by the Justices of the Peace at the various county quarter sessions. These were the days when the watch, the only police, were going timidly about the streets at night with their lanterns. These were the days of Dickens, when paupers like Oliver Twist were sometimes looked after by the parish authorities. Only a quarter of the children of London received any schooling. The Thames was then the great sewer. Garbage and sewage were shot into it without any form of treatment. The windows on this side of the House of Commons had to be kept closed when the wind was off the river because of the stench. And yet it was from the River Thames, unfiltered and unpurified, that many of the inhabitants of London drew their water supply. An act passed in 1855 sorted out the many small local authorities into 41 vestries and district boards and over them all was set up the Metropolitan Board of Works. The area which it controlled 
was almost the same as the administrative county of today, and the board did in fact, though but faintly, foreshadow the London County Council. The Metropolitan Board did some good work. It built the Victoria and Albert embankments, so that here the banks of the Thames no longer presented many acres of evil-smelling mud at low tide. Into the estuary, 82 miles of sewers discharged treated sewage. This reduced flooding and removed much of the evil smell. Many of the streets we know today were constructed by the Metropolitan Board, which laid out many parks. And the voluntary, privately manned fire appliances like this were replaced by the London Fire Brigade. The Metropolitan Board, however, was not popular. It was extravagant and not directly elected by the people of London. So, by Act of Parliament in 1888, it was abolished. And in 1889, the London County Council met for the first time. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, said the Londoner. I'm going to look after myself. Albert Brown, the Londoner of today, is still the independent sort of chap he has been throughout the ages. And though today his life may be more complicated, he is still the head of a family and master of his own breakfast table. Every moment of his day brings him into contact with the work of the London County Council. The council builds and maintains most of the bridges on which he and thousands of others pass to and fro every day. The council's coat of arms is a symbol of London's character. The wavy lines indicate the river and the port. Above them is the Red Cross of St George for England and the Golden Lion from the King's coat of arms. The crown in castle form indicates an enclosed town or city. The whole sets forth in heraldic language that London is the royal centre of England situated upon the water. As Big Ben, on the far side of Westminster Bridge, chimes the beginning of each new working day, across the river at the county hall the staff is arriving, converging from all parts of London, people whose job it is to deal with the problems that each new day creates and to administer the score of services that the average Londoner takes for granted. The council is run rather on parliamentary lines, with a majority party on one side of the house and the opposition on the other. In front of the chairman sit the clerk of the council and his chief assistant. The bulk of the council's work is carried out by committees, smaller groups of councillors who are appointed according to the strength of their parties on the council. Much that the council does, however, has no politics attached to it, and agreements are reached after a friendly discussion. Each committee deals with a branch of the council's work, for example, education or finance, and each branch has a permanent staff of officials to advise committees and carry out their decisions. This large staff of paid officers is directed by the clerk of the council and the chief officers of the various departments. Many times throughout the day, Albert makes contact with the coat of arms that marks the various services maintained by the LCC. The London Ambulance Service, for example. Who is inside this one? Perhaps a person injured in a street accident or an accident in the home. Perhaps it is a case of some illness requiring urgent hospital attention. But the patient, whoever it may be, is in the hands of a highly trained and experienced staff backed up by a first-class organization with up-to-date equipment. No precious minutes are being lost in getting this patient into hospital. Or perhaps Albert sees a fire on his way to work. The call goes out to the London Fire Brigade. Albert, like a true Londoner, has thrilled to see the turnout of the Fire Brigade. The gleaming of the engines, the flash of the helmets, the clang of the bell, set every head turning to catch a glimpse of the fire. The LCC saves millions of pounds worth of property every year. Today, the fireman, romantic and courageous figure as he is, depends not only upon courage, but upon scientific equipment and training. Albert may happen to be working on a big new building site. Plans for new buildings are checked by the LCC before work begins, and now and then a district surveyor calls to inspect work in progress. The symbol on his warrant once more announces that the watch over London's safety goes on. The district surveyor may inspect any part of the building, and he sees that the materials are everything they should be. Here he takes a sample from a concrete mixer at work to make sure it conforms to the standards laid down. Yes, that's all right. And then he goes over to check that the steel framework is clothed in the thickness of brick that the council's fire prevention rules require. Yes, we'll pass that too. Meanwhile, an LCC midwife comes to call next door to the Browns where there's a new baby. 
She dashes over for a brief word with Mrs. Brown, whom she also attended a few months back before knocking at Mrs. Jones's door. She'll be making a daily call on Mrs. Jones in the next two weeks, so this time it is on a midwife's hat that we see the symbol of service. Sometimes the symbol appears in places where the Browns never see it. Where does the water go? asks Kathleen Brown as she helps her mother wash the dishes. Down the drain, of course, says Mrs. Brown. The water gurgling along the sewers of the local councils eventually finds its way into the main drainage system of the LCC. So much of London is below high water mark that pumping stations must raise the sewage from almost every district to enable it to continue its way to the outfalls. This diagram shows the course of the main sewers that drain London and the points to which they conduct the sewage. This is specially treated at Beckton and Cross Ness and the liquid contents are discharged into the Thames, while the remaining sludge, as it is called, is loaded into specially constructed vessels which take it out to sea and shoot it there. Here again the symbol appears watching over the well-being of the community. A far cry from the days when the only drains of London were the streams and rivers carrying untreated sewage into the Thames. But Mrs. Albert Brown is very much more aware of what is going on above than below ground. The two older children go to an LCC primary school. Leaving them to the teacher's care, she goes on to do her shopping. The children will stay at the primary school until they're about 11 when they will go to one of several types of secondary school according to their ability and interest in different subjects. They learn not only from books, they also learn how to become good citizens able to earn their living. Girls, for instance, enjoy domestic science, boys carpentry, metalwork and so on. The children's bodies as well as their minds are developed to full health and strength. They receive regular medical examination, general health is noted, Defective eyesight and teeth are attended to. Good meals are prepared in modern kitchens and in case of need, supplied free. Adult education is also an important part of the LCC's work. More than 200,000 people attend LCC classes every year in colleges, polytechnics and evening institutes. Among the names, you'll find that of Albert Brown. Among the hundreds of subjects taught, Poultry keeping is a surprising but popular one. Carpentry attracts big classes. Some seek training to enable them to pass craft examinations. Others try to create with their own hands the answer to some domestic need of the moment. But that's looking ahead to the dark evenings. Today, it's still early morning. Meanwhile, busy as she is, Mrs. Brown cannot resist a look at the kiddies playing in the garden of the children's home. The LCC maintains 30 such homes, most of them out of London, looking after 3,000 children. 6,000 others are in foster homes. Many of these children are without homes of their own and many without parents. Some have been deserted, others have been neglected or cruelly treated. In the happy surroundings of a well-equipped home like this, the staff do all they can to make the children feel safe, to wipe out memories of being unwanted and unloved. But the London County badge also surmounts the signboard of the Infant Welfare Clinic and this is where Mrs. Brown regularly brings her own baby. She attended here before baby was born. Here is the youngest generation of little Londoners. Their mothers bring them here to be weighed and have their progress recorded. If they're not doing as well as they should, a doctor investigates. Diphtheria immunization is asked for by most mothers as a protection against this once deadly disease. There are comfortable chairs for mother and toys for the children while they wait. There is no institutional atmosphere here. It's more like a club whose amenities are available to any woman who has qualified for membership by adding a new Londoner to the population. The advice, of course, is free and so is the cod liver oil which mothers receive for their children. Fruit juices and baby foods are sold at specially reduced prices. Mrs. Brown still has a busy morning ahead of her. She has to get her shopping done. Yet, as she goes on her way, she is quite unaware that the man waiting until she has been served is another servant of the council, the inspector of weights and measures, who not only visits every shop, but every other place, such as this street market, where goods are sold to the public by weight. The checking is done quickly and carefully in front of the tradesman. 
Now, our story takes us a bus ride away to the outskirts of London, where, in a large house in a quiet suburban road, lives Mrs. Brown's uncle. It is, in fact, one of the homes which the LCC maintains for elderly people. Mrs. Brown often takes him an ounce of tobacco or a few apples, not because he really needs them, but because he likes to be remembered. She has a chat with him in the privacy of his own room. Today, a photograph has arrived from his grandson in Australia. There's a kindly and considerate staff to look after these old people. Their little individual fads and fancies are consulted and everything possible is done to make them feel that they matter. Some like to sit quietly alone in their rooms, but the majority like company. And in the comfortable sitting rooms, there's always somebody to have a chat with or join in a game of cards. So the Londoner's symbol attends Albert Brown and his family all through the working day. He finds it in one of the council's restaurants where he goes for his midday meal. Here there is quick, clean service and in a cheerfully decorated room, Albert takes his lunch. And if Albert Brown and his family seek recreation in the open air, it is the LCC which maintains the parks and provides outdoor entertainment. The parks are also the sports club, where thousands of Londoners seek recreation. The young and energetic, the older and more leisurely. Here the foreigner can take a walk and study the mysteries of cricket, that strange cult of the English. This scene is not in a romantic Scottish glen, but in the heart of London, a few hundred yards from a bus stop. How refreshing it is to leave the turmoil of the streets for the peace of a flower garden, where a mother can forget her daily chores for a while, while baby gets his sun and fresh air. The parks are indeed the lungs of London. Or if they decide to go to the pictures, it is once again the LCC which licenses the cinemas and insists that the building shall conform to the rules made to protect the safety and health of Albert Brown and his family and also make sure that the films they see are suitable for exhibition. And when election time comes round, Albert Brown is not merely a listener. He is a speaker. This is his city his council, his election. He stands as a candidate and the election takes place with all the excitement of a parliamentary election and incidentally with exactly the same democratic formalities. The vote by ballot, the secrecy of the voting paper, the counting of the votes, all the checking, culminating in the exciting moment when the result is announced and Albert Brown is in. So Albert Brown the Londoner joins the 149 other Londoners in the council chamber of Britain's largest municipal authority. I'd like to say a few words on this report of the Housing Committee. The number of new homes built by the council since 1945 is indeed impressive. And we can be reasonably proud of the great efforts that have produced so much. For more blocks of well-equipped flats within reach of London's workshops, factories and offices, more estates of houses designed to suit different family needs. More bungalows for the elderly who cannot manage the stairs. More of all these are still needed. But, Mr Chairman, we cannot relax our efforts. I feel it is my duty to the electors who have sent me here as their representative to see that the needs of those who are still living in unsatisfactory conditions are never forgotten. Albert Brown has made his contribution to the debate and the Council will go on to decide its policy. Every night, when the LCC staff go home, they are aware that their work for London is never done. Tomorrow and the next day, they will be back to deal with more problems of running the greatest metropolis in the world. So Albert Brown, the typical Londoner, one of the inheritors of a historic past, one of the planners of a great future, goes on his way.